Well, thanks very much, uh, Craig, for that very generous introduction. I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people and whose lands we're gathered today. Pay my respects to elders and to any Indigenous people in the room and commit myself as a member of the Albanese government to the implementation in full of the Uluru Statement from the heart. Uh, Craig, the simple answer to your question is that uh, not doing country music gives me a lot of time in my diary to do, do other things. Uh, and thank you for welcoming us here to Whittlesea Council. Um, thank you too to Chris and Jane for bringing this uh, conference together uh, and to Uncle Perry to uh, welcoming on, uh, us onto traditional lands. Uh, the collaboration between the Red Cross, Swinburne and Whittlesea Council really is a model of different parts of the community working together to tackle big social challenges. Mm -hmm. The issue of community connection is one that's near and dear to my heart, and perhaps no one in this room needs the case made as to why community matters. But for those of you who might find sceptics in your organisation, uh, let me start by talking about the power of community connection through the lens of a story. The story is that of diamonds, a stone that uh, those of you who are married may well be familiar with. Uh, when diamonds are dug up, in, often in South Africa, the world's largest diamond mines, uh, they're extracted from the ground in one of the most low-trust environments that you can imagine. South Africa has among the highest levels of inequality in the world, and South African diamond miners are not among the best-paid workers in the world. They operate under conditions of extreme distrust in which workers are scanned on the way in and scanned on the way out. Uh, workers operate in overalls without pockets, and so diamonds can't be concealed, have to pass through metal detectors, and have sometimes been asked to take x-rays to prove they haven't swallowed stones. And then the diamonds, in many cases, go to New York, to the 47th Street Di uh, Diamond uh, Processing Facility, uh, which through which uh, more than half of the diamonds that enter the United States pass. Uh, that is a building in which uh, diamond dealers uh, operate at different stages of the process. Uh, some will be assessing the diamonds, some will be cutting the diamonds. And if they operated in the same levels of distrust as the diamond miners, then the building would never be able to operate. Instead, they operate in an environment of thick trust, uh, many of those involved in the Diamond De New York Diamond Dealers Club uh, not only know one another, but their families have known one another going back generations. Uh, the Diamond Dealers Club is uh, knitted together by family networks through a Jewish community, uh, which is often intermarried and which is very hard to enter into. In this environment of thick trust, uh, diamonds can simply be passed from person to person, from floor to floor, with utter trust that no one would ever imagine ripping someone else off. While diamond miners need to operate with high security margins uh, and uh, insurance to, uh, to, uh, against getting, getting ripped off, the diamond dealers operate with very thin margins, and it's why they're able to dominate. They don't dominate because they sit on top of a natural resource. They dominate because of their social capital. Social capital is now accepted as being uh, as important as the physical capital that makes up roads and bridges, or the human capital, the skills and education that allow workers uh, to be more productive. Uh, but it wasn't always thus. Uh, when I was uh, studying at Harvard University, I worked on the research team of Robert Putnam, who then brought out Bowling Alone, uh, and who was one of the pioneers in making the case that social capital mattered. Uh, Putnam was making the case for social capital uh, as akin to physical and human capital, uh, which was a little different from the approach sociologists like James Coleman had taken previously, say, saying that social capital always had to be good. Uh, Putnam said, these are ties. They're mostly good, just as roads, roads, bridges, and education are mostly used to the good but they don't inherently have to be used to benefit the community. The tie is the thing that we're measuring. And as more and more scholars have looked into social capital, uh, they've come to recognise that societies that have thicker ties tend to be more affluent, that people who know more friends and are more connected to their communities 
tend to be healthier, not just mentally healthier, but physically too. Uh, and that communities where people have uh, no, strong webs of reciprocity and trust uh, tend to be happier places to live. And yet, if we look at the statistics over the last generation, Australia has become increasingly disconnected. Uh, Nick Terrell and I wrote a book uh, two years ago uh, in which we laid out the statistics for Australian community life over the last couple of decades. We surveyed large mass membership-based organisations, think Scouts, Guides, Rotary, Lions, and found that their membership had tended to rise until the late 1960s, uh, and since then had fallen by an average of two thirds. We looked at surveys that asked people, are you an active member of a community organisation? And found that whether we were talking about social organisations or political organisations, people were less likely to say yes today than in the past. We looked at the pattern of volunteering and saw that volunteer firefighter numbers had fallen substantially in the decade leading up to the 2019-20 Black Summer bushfires. We saw too that overall volunteering rates had trended downwards and that that trend had accentuated through COVID. We looked at Roy Morgan's surveys of uh, sporting participation. We were able to break down across more than 20 Australian sports the share of Australians participating in those sports. That too painted a worrying picture. Whether you're looking at cricket or tennis, netball or AFL, the share of Australians participating in sport has fallen since the beginning of the millennium. Robert Putnam's book in 2000 was called Bowling Alone, and I'm sad to say that the share of Australians who are 10-pin bowling and lawn bowling have both declined over the course of the last 20 years. The physical activities that we've shifted into tend to be more solitary activities. We're more likely to go for a walk or a run. We're more likely to go to the gym. But team sport has declined over this period. Nick Terrell and I noted too that the share of Australians actively engaged in a religious community had declined. This has theological implications, of course, and I'm sure there's people much better qualified than me to talk about that. But what matters most for communitarians uh, is that attending a religious service has often been a gateway into volunteering or donating. Those who attend a religious service are more likely to volunteer, even excluding their religious volunteering. They're more likely to donate, even excluding their religious donations. As Robert Putnam in his book, American Grace puts it, uh, attending a religious service just makes you a nicer person. I saw this through my grandparents, Rolly and Jean Stebbins, who were involved in Ivanhoe Methodist Church uh, and whose work with the ch uh, church extended well beyond turning up to service on Sundays. Uh, Ivanhoe Methodist would uh, uh, bring, uh, help sponsor refugees, and they would have uh, refugees living in their, in their family. Uh, it would help assist uh, those in the local Aboriginal community, and often there'd be people in the Aboriginal community living in their household. Uh, my father, Rolly, was constantly off driving people to medical appointments. But all of this was brokered through his activities in a, in a religious community. So the decline in religious participation matters to community as well. We've also seen a drop in the share of Australians uh, who uh, have uh, large numbers of close friends and no large numbers of their neighbours. In Reconnected, Nick Terrell and I re-ran a survey that had first been done in the mid-1980s. I'd asked, how many close friends do you have with whom you could share a confidence without having to watch what you say? Uh, back then, the Austra average Australian said they had nine close friends. But when we refielded the survey, we got the average answer of five. The survey asked, too, how many people are there around here you could drop in to borrow something, like a cup of sugar, without having to ask for an invitation? Uh, back then, it was 11. Uh, now it's fallen to five. So in the period since the TV show Neighbours hit Australian screens, Australians have become half as likely to know their real life neighbours. All of this was accentuated too in a period where the former government took an approach that charities uh, were more of a threat than an opportunity. Uh, we saw attacks on charitable advocacy, prompting three open letters uh, to successive Liberal Prime Ministers 
asking them to back off their attacks on the sector. We saw a person appointed as head of the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission who had made his name as a critic of charities. He uh, talked about impure, what he called impure altruism in the charity sector uh, and had said that uh, uh, they do criticise charities such as Recognise and Beyond Blue. And so in that environment, it wasn't a surprise the charities found themselves hunkering down, uh, being nervous about getting involved in community debates. Uh, since we were elected in 22nd of May last year, we've sought to reset the relationship between the federal government and the charity sector. Uh, we see the voices of charities as being welcome into the community debate. Uh, we understand that Australia's democracy thrives uh, when the conversation around law reform includes the informed voices of those at community legal centres. Uh, when the discussion around uh, the environment includes the voices of those in environmental groups. When the conversation around poverty and inequality includes the lived experience of those who are engaged with helping the most disadvantaged. We've appointed as the head of the Charities Commission, Sue Woodward, a woman who's worked for her entire career, career collaborating with charities, including through work at Justice Connect, a Victorian organisation many of you will know. Uh, Sue's appointment as Charities Commissioner was warmly welcomed, and she set about uh, working to ensure that public trust in charities is maximised, that we imp improve people's abilities to start charities, and that we reduce the unnecessary reporting burden that falls on Australia's charities. We also understand that charities are under a lot of financial pressure. Uh, the cost of living crisis is hitting Australian households, but it's also affecting uh, our charities and their ability to help the, mo the most vulnerable. We came to office with a pledge to uh, set a target of doubling philanthropy by 2030. That's a pretty substantial goal to double anything in just uh, seven years' time. Uh, but the uh, goal only takes us to the level of philanthropy that New Zealand has. And as Andrew Denton once put it in the sporting contest, if we can't beat New Zealand, well, where are we really? <laughs> we believe that increasing philanthropy is an important part of ensuring that our charity and not-for-profit sector is able to survive and thrive. Uh, we've asked the Productivity Commission to carry out a major inquiry on philanthropy. That'll look at some of the tax settings around philanthropy, which are clearly not exactly the tax settings we'd have now if we were setting up the system anew. But it will also look uh, at the norms around charitable giving, uh, why it is that relatively few of Australia's billionaires have signed the Gates Buffett Giving Pledge. Uh, and working with organisations such as Kids in Philanthropy, to try and build a culture of giving back from the youngest age. Uh, I went along with kids in philanthropy to Middle Park Primary School a couple of weeks ago to see the work that they're doing, to talk about uh, generosity and giving back to the community uh, in that context. We know that there's such a thing called a helper's high. Uh, I'm a big fan of randomised trials and one of my favourites uh, uh -huh. takes a group of volunteer participants and divides them into two randomly selected groups. At the start of the day, each group is given about $30. One group is told to go and spend it on themselves, and so they buy a sweet treat or uh, go out and see a movie. Uh, the other group is told to spend it on others, and so they'll give it to a homeless person or find a charity and make a donation. At the end of the day, the two groups are surveyed to ask about their happiness. It may not surprise this room to know that the givers are far happier at the end of the day no, than those who spend it themselves. My department's oh, such sorry. a clever study that another team of researchers decided to use the same right methodology, but well, rather than like they, 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 they measured blood pressure. And they found that the reduction in blood pressure at the end of the day was as substantial as you get from taking hypertension medication. And so giving back to the community may well be one of the best medicines of all. We're looking to increase volunteering in the community. We funded Volunteering Australia to put together a national volunteering strategy. Uh, the impact of COVID was that many Australians got out of the habit of giving back. We need to ensure that those opportunities are there uh, and that where professionals are looking to volunteer their skills, we're able to match them up 
with an organisation that can best use their, those skills. For people who want to engage in episodic volunteering, uh, we need to ensure that there's opportunities like Clean Up Australia Day every day of the year. Uh, for people who are uh, homebound, we need to make sure that there's opportunities to volunteer online. Uh, and the Digivol program or the National Library's Trove program offer a few windows into way, the ways in which online volunteering uh, may be a success. We're engaging too with the charity and not-for-profit sector. Uh, since I became Assistant Minister in May last year, I've travelled around the country holding uh, community forums with Australia's charities in every capital city. Uh, I've done this because I think it's important to garner the ideas of charities uh, and to work out how we as a government can best partner with charities. Our desire to build a stronger charity and not-for-profit sector uh, isn't driven uh, by a view that cha uh, charities should step up so that government can step back. Uh, instead, our philosophy is that we need a strong charity sector because the challenges are too big for government to tackle alone. And to give you a little window into that approach, in the last budget, we announced a $200 million fund for tackling deep disadvantage, partnering with foundations such as the Paul Ramsey Foundation. Uh, this will look to scale up initiatives such as those that have been pursued in Logan, Bernie uh, and Burke, uh, initiatives that have partnered with local leaders uh, in order to deal with uh, formally, uh, th problems that were formerly thought of as intractable. Uh, low school attendance, uh, still high stillbirth rates, uh, levels of youth violence. In each of those communities, there's been locally driven solutions which look promising. We're keen to be able to scale them up and we see great potential for government to partner with philanthropy to this end. Uh, it's not no great surprise that the, head, the most senior public servant in Australia, Glenn Davis, uh, is a big champion of this, having formerly been the head of the largest foundation in Australia. And Glenn's brokering of that work uh, is going to be absolutely essential to ensuring we get the very best out of philanthropy and that government uh, contributes as well. But we're keen too to get your ideas because we understand that the trends that Australia is facing in terms of community disconnection uh, are bigger than we can serve and solve in one term of government and bigger than government can solve alone. Uh, one of the things I really love about the publication that Jane and her colleagues have put together uh, is that it doesn't just bust myths, it also talks about practical solutions for community building. Uh, you'll see too the uh, community bingo uh, sheet uh, attached to your, uh, to your program there, uh, in which you can uh, uh, get the nine bingo squares filled in uh, by meeting people from the Red Cross or Whittlesea Council or people in various walks of life. It's aiming to get you to build connections in this room. And we all know that our experience of attending an event is tangibly different uh, if you connect with just one other person. So imagine how much better it will be uh, for those of you who are able to shout bingo at the end of the day. Uh, this is the sort of initiative that we're keen to see building across Australian communities. Uh, some of rebuilding community happens at a national level with a volunteering strategy. But some of it happens too at a local level. Uh, my wife and I put on street Christmas drinks uh, for our, uh, our, our street every year. Uh, it turns out to be remarkably simple. We take last year's invitation, change the date, photocopy 30 copies and put it in our neighbour's letterboxes. Uh, they drop around and we enjoy a, a coffee and a sandwich on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, it turns out we like our neighbours, but even if we didn't like them, this would be a good thing to do. Uh, spending a couple of hours on a Sunday afternoon in order to ensure that if someone walks out our front door carrying a television during the day, our neighbours are more likely to step up and say, hey, what are you doing with that? Connected streets aren't just safer streets, they're happier as well. And so I'd urge you to think about putting on uh, your own version of street Christmas drinks uh, as you get to the end of this year. These sorts of simple uh, random acts of kindness uh, are important because they remind us that community connection is ultimately as important as anything else we do. Uh, the writer David Brooks draws the distinction between what he calls two kinds of virtues. He talks about CV virtue, virtues, 
those things you put on your resume, uh, the awards you've gotten, the promotions you've received, uh, the titles you've earned. And then David talks about eulogy virtues. They're the things that we'll say about, people will say about us when they're gone, uh, when we're gone, uh, how we treated other people, uh, whether we were kind to our neighbours, uh, the generosity that we showed to somebody who was down on their luck. It's those eulogy virtues which we're uh, boosting today uh, through building social connections. Uh, it turns out that those eulogy virtues and a more connected community have spin-offs in terms of health, wealth and happiness. But fundamentally, they're just really important in their own right. To build a connected community is to build a better Australia. And to all of you as fellow community builders, Thank you for your work and looking forward to the conversation. <laughs> Thank you, Assistant Minister, um, for those insightful words. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Kath Cooney because, uh, Assistant Minister, they don't trust me uh, in asking the questions or moderating questions because, indeed, my knowledge in this field wouldn't compare to Kath. Um, Kath, we're really pleased uh, you're available today to, to moderate this session. Just a little bit about you before I hand over to you, if I may. Um, so Kath joins us uh, from the Victorian Foundation uh, for Survivors of Torture, and she's delivered uh, innovative uh, programs to really support the inclusion uh, of uh, asylum seekers and refugees um, through some really critical work. But personally as well, uh, as, as coming from Australian Red Cross, we're exceptionally pleased uh, to have Kath as a volunteer, I think for over 17 years, is that right? And so um, what makes a pleasure for me in working at Australian Red Cross is the opportunity to engage with volunteers of deep expertise and a range of experiences. So Kath, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Hi, everyone. It's, um, it's an amazing ride when you're a Red Cross volunteer. You even get to do things like this. So really happy to be here. Um, thank you so much, Assistant Minister. You gave us so much to think about. And now we've got a chance to have a bit of a conversation about it as well. Um, with the people in the room, um, there's two microphones coming around. Jasmine, I think, is it? And uh, not sure who's got the microphones. And then after that, um, we'll have a chance to talk to our online colleagues. Welcome. Um, and uh, Jane will, has got the iPad there and we'll have a chance to have uh, your input as well. Um, so while people get their questions ready, I'd like to jump in uh, and ask a question about, I was so interested in your Christmas drinks. Um, I don't suppose I can come if I don't live in your street. <laughs> um, and I really understand that idea of working at the local and doing what you can in your own thing. Um, but we know that neighbours are the um, people that we're going to go to when there's an emergency, big or small. So what can be done at a national level to encourage those small connections? Love to hear your thoughts about that, please. Well, thanks very much, uh, Kath. Um, you're, uh, you're always welcome to be a special guest at our drinks. So very, uh, very yeah, love, love to have you along. Uh, one year, my uh, Northern Territory colleague, Luke Gosling, wasn't able to fly home for the weekend, so he came along. And people did sort of wonder what a Northern Territory MP was doing at our, uh, our local uh, street drinks. Uh, Neighbour Day is uh, an initiative which was uh, put together uh, over a decade ago now and run by Relationships Australia, uh, and it you know, aims to uh, reinvigorate that conversation around connecting with your neighbours, a sort of focal point in which you might check in on someone who's uh, looking as though they're a bit, uh, a bit lonely or isolated. Uh, it's a, a nice initiative uh, which sprang out of some horrific incidents of uh, older people having died in their own homes and, and not being discovered for weeks. Uh, but it's a, a reminder too that loneliness doesn't just isn't just something that affects older Australians. It's one of the myths that Jane busts in this uh, Social Connection 101 book, uh, and so it's an important opportunity to you know, connect with the uh, the new uh, single who's moved into an apartment down the street as well. Now, another initiative which I love in Britain and I think someone could easily replicate in Australia is called the Good Gym. Uh, the Good Gym is pairs up. Uh, people who'd like to get fit and isolated seniors. On a Saturday morning, the person who wants to get fit straps on their runners uh, and goes for a 20-minute uh, run to the house of the isolated senior that they're there to help. Uh, they have a cup of tea, have a chat about the week. Often that'll be the only face-to-face -face interaction that that isolated person will have. 
uh, and uh, that person is called the coach. Uh, they're called the coach because they're the reason that the uh, runner puts on their shoes. And when the runner gets back, they've done uh, uh, double plus good social capital. Uh, they've, got, they've got themselves fit and they've helped to reduce isolation at the same time. Great. Sounds, there's a challenge for us to start that one here. Thank you. <laughs> so questions in the audience. Um, please say your name as you um, take a microphone. Would someone like to ask a question or uh, continue the conversation? Hello. What's your name? Uh, my name is Bronwyn Clark. Hi, Bronwyn. From the National Growth Areas Alliance. We represent all of the fast-growing councils in outer suburban areas across Australia. It's 5.3 million people. And we talk a lot about this process of a paddock becoming a postcode. And one of the great um, challenges that communities face when they move into a brand new housing estate is social connection. Quite often, there are no places to congregate. There are no community facilities. You know, you have to get in the car and drive to do your shopping or to find a library or a pool or anything like that. So... What's the opportunity when the Albanese government is developing a national urban policy, and I'm honoured to have been appointed to the Urban Policy Forum by Minister King, where are the opportunities to have in the planning and development process and, and some planning for social connection as new communities are built? How do we make that happen without it just being a retrofit by a local government years down the track. Uh, thanks very much, Ron. Uh, my wife is a landscape architect, and so I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the importance of uh, the built environment to building social connections. Um, something, something as simple as good footpaths can make a huge difference as to whether someone feels able to walk. Uh, and, of course, you're far more likely to have a substantive engagement with your neighbours if you're walking past them on the footpath or cycling along the cycle path than if you're driving from one spot to another. Ensuring that there's good quality parks can be important and the meshing of exercise equipment with parks has been an important development because those, those uh, outdoor exercise stations don't just allow people to stay fit but are often a place where a conversation starts. Uh, the proliferation of local cafes and ensuring that the zoning is right to have cafes in areas where kids can play easily uh, creates another point of social contact. Uh, we're just discovering too, and my wife Gwyneth's work has been part of this, uh, that schoolyards need to be designed in ways that allow kids to chat. Turns out schoolyards have been designed very well for fit boys to play sport, but not so well to allow teenage girls to catch up with one another. So having those nooks and those spaces uh, where girls can develop those strong ties with one another uh, is uh, an important part of, of designing space. Uh, you would uh, uh, Clearly your appointment by Catherine King reflects the fact that you're thinking hard about these sorts of things, uh, but I think it's important for all of us to envisage what we can do in our local community. Uh, we did something really simple in our house. Uh, we had an old park bench and put it out the front with a little sign on it saying, please take a seat, in brackets, don't take it away, just sit on it. <laughs> uh, and people do. People drop by. There's a woman who told us that uh, when she's walking the dog, she now walks it, walks it past our house because she gets a bit tired and she likes to be able to stop and sit down. Uh, we had Jehovah's Witnesses uh, door knocking in the street the other day uh, and uh, while I don't think they got many conversions, at least they got to sit down and, and rest their legs on the bench. Uh, so there's little things that each of us can do to make communities more livable and more engaged. Thank you. Thanks, Bronwyn. Another question. Let's try and line up a few comments and questions. Would someone like to raise an issue? So let's do that one and then that one, okay? Doesn't matter which way. Yep. <laughs> Hello, Hello. Uh, my name is Raina Ogren. I'm a senior research fellow at Bolton Clark and we're doing research in um, developing a new uh, social connection community actually in Glen Ira, so not in this council, but I'm really delighted to be here. Um, your answer to the question was very interesting and I think it comes to the crux of the problem where Australians are incredibly individualistic. 
And we're talking about the need to connect socially. So what can we do to enable structures, um, governance, supports, councils, state, federal level, policy, um, pra practices, all of these things to support uh, that social connection at every level, like we need to do. This is part of health at every level, well-being at every level. What can be done at that at that um a top-down approach rather than putting it back on the bottom up, which both need to happen, but we really need that top-down as well. Can I respond to that? Yes, please, yeah. <laughs> um, Rainer, it's, uh, it's go, your question is fabulous because it goes to one of the things I've been trying to do in this portfolio. The uh, chari I had the charities portfolio for my party uh, for the nine years of opposition, which gave me a chance to think through what I'd want to do if I was appointed as the, the assistant minister. And my appointment has, has meant that I'm thinking about the charities portfolio, not as a narrow charities regulation portfolio, but as a broad community building portfolio. Uh, and then reaching out to colleagues uh, like Catherine, Catherine King, like Mark Butler in health, uh, like Bill Shorten in disability, to see how we can build that community building aspect uh, into the way in which programs are rolled out. Uh, to take one simple example, as we're doing disaster resilience grants, I believe we ought to uh, have in the back of our heads not just how a community can quickly respond to fight a fire, but also how it can maintain the social ties that will be important in dealing with uh, disasters. Uh, and we know the frequency and severity of natural disasters is only going to get, uh, get, get larger. Um, so I can only encourage you to do the thing that uh, uh, my Chief of Staff, Nick Terrell, and I have been doing our best to do, which is to mainstream community connection, uh, to, say, to encourage others to see this not as a silo, but as uh, an area that cross cuts what government and the community sector does. Uh, and that the job of building community is a job for all of us. Thank you. And the question there? You're not going to get to sit for long. <laughs> Hi, I'm from a um, small rural shire, uh, the Pyrenees, and so we have a very low rate payer base, um, probably more roads than people. Um, and we're certainly noticing um, a fall off in the amount of volunteering and social connection, particularly after lockdowns in Victoria, but also through a number of natural disasters that we've had. Um, what's the sort of support, I guess, is the federal government looking around, I guess, supporting smaller rural councils across Australia to do that resilience work because we don't really have the money for it. Um, and I think um, in comparison to, say, some of our, our urban colleagues. Oh, thank you. And what was your name, sorry? Fiona, uh, the, uh, the, the work of building community on an oily rag is one that I think will be familiar to uh, uh, those, most of those in the room. It is uh, certainly challenging to build this into uh, scarce budgets. But one of the aspects of it is that sometimes connecting people is cheaper than rolling out asphalt. Uh, it can turn out that simply including a call for volunteers into uh, materials the council is already sending out reminds people of the ways in which they connect. Uh, a range of the online volunteering match databases are happy to help uh, and easily scalable into rural and remote communities. Uh, the opportunity too for council to play a role in bringing existing community groups together can matter. Um, so I think about Yak and Danda, a uh, Victor Victorian uh, rural area that's been particularly successful in building connections between local community groups in the town. Uh, and indeed, uh, so much so that when one of the local businesses looked like it was going to close down, uh, a consortium of, of local groups uh, stepped in together to buy it and set it up as a co-op. Uh, so there's, there's opportunities to act as a, uh, a joiner uh, not just to simply be a, a funder, uh, which is an important role, but one that's sometimes more challenging for a cash trap council. So terrific to hear all these actual examples. Thank you. And um, I'm going to be thinking about social connectedness on an oily rag. <laughs> um, the next question. Yeah, there's one and then two, please. Hi, 
Hi, um, my name's Sue Hunt. I'm from Swinburne Uni. I'm a researcher. I'm going to throw a spicy one at you. Uh, so all this volunteering is great. It's primarily done on the unpaid labor of women, especially in churches. So I'm wondering how, how are you, not you, but the government, communities, how are we going to prevent the homelessness homelessness? Uh, that is affecting older women now because of all the volunteering and all the good they did. And if you look around the room, <laughs> what have we got? So women are all over this. <clears throat> what can be done to make men step up? Great question, Sarah. Love it. Uh, so I, have, I also have the portfolio of Treasury, which means I sometimes have the uh, experience on one day from going from a multinational tax conversation when in a room which is almost all men to then moving to a community conversation in a room that's almost all women. Uh, you do see the, the very strongly gendered nature of the conversation. Uh, and indeed, one of the reasons why for the, the trends in bowl, we see in Bowling Alone or in my own work, Disconnected, uh, is that the large-scale entry of women into the paid labour force has meant that there are fewer women outside the paid labour force engaged in work in religious communities uh, or in local, local community groups. Uh, we've got the uh, volunteering awards and volunteer, volunteering grants, uh, but of course there's a good reason why the federal government stopped short of saying that we should pay volunteers. Uh, it wouldn't be volunteering uh, if you were paid to do it. So the celebration and support that we're providing, I think, is uh, the right balance, uh, as well as providing opportunities to link up volunteer volunteers uh, and ensure that people's skills are being best used. In the area of corporate volunteering, uh, we're trying to move companies away from that idea that you phone up a charity on Monday morning and say, hey, I've got 100 bodies who want to volunteer for a day on Friday, uh, to which the answer is normally, sure, you can come and paint a fence. But if you'd given us three months' notice, we could have matched up your, the accountants in your firm with charities that really need somebody to help do their, do their books. Uh, so better brokering connections on volunteers matters. I tend to think of the issue of homelessness as being distinct from, from vol volunteering. Uh, and as you say, the fastest growing... Okay. Um, homeless people now because of family violence, because of unpaid labour, not just volunteering, but domestic work, child caring, and all the volunteering they do, they don't have superannuation. So it's extremely directly related and not pressuring women, but encouraging women to do this stuff has real implications as they get older. No, Homelessness, <laughs> it's huge. Absolutely. No, I totally agree with you, Sue, that older women are fastest growing cohort entering homelessness. I don't think that's because they're volunteering. Uh, I think that's certainly, certainly the challenge of homelessness is a real one. Uh, we've increased homelessness funding, uh, aimed to work more with the states and territories on, the housing, uh, on housing development. Uh, and the Housing Australia Future Fund is aimed to set up 30, 000, build 30,000 additional social and affordable homes, 4,000 of those earmarked for women and children fleeing domestic and family violence. Um, so in that area, I think of the challenge of homelessness as being one which is really a core responsibility of government uh, and a government which for a decade, we had a decade with the federal government essentially removed its responsibility for tackling homelessness left us with a severe shortage of social and affordable homes. So we're looking to step in to deal, deal with that gap. Uh, it's a core priority for government, Amanda Rishworth in the social services portfolio and Julie Collins uh, in the housing portfolio. Uh, Julie's somebody who has direct experience of uh, uh, relying on, on public housing uh, and is acutely aware in her conversations with those social and public housing providers uh, of the importance of expanding the stock and providing opportunities uh, for uh, to, to move into stable accommodation. Uh, in my own city of Canberra, we've built uh, our second common ground facility, uh, which is aims to be a facility that provides stable housing for those who've been sleeping rough. And to see somebody who's been on the streets for a decade 
in their own apartment for the very first time is, is pretty remarkable. Uh, we need more of those stories replicated around the country. And I suppose it's not surprising we're talking about everything. It's all very complex and interconnected, isn't it? Um, I think in terms of being inclusive, we have a question from someone online, our online colleagues. Yes. Um, Jane's going to read that out to us. Is this on? Can you yep. hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Nikki. Nikki Lovell from Gather My Crew. Um, I'm interested to know how volunteering is being defined and whether informal volunteering is being considered. Um, so Nikki's from an organisation called Gather My Crew, and Gather My Crew is a resource that's probably worth telling you all about, just in case you ever need it. Uh, it is set up in order to make it easy to deal with the situation in which you have a friend who is in crisis. Uh, imagine a friend who's just realised that they're going to have to go into chemotherapy treatment and has a couple of kids to look after. Uh, or somebody who's uh, su suddenly uh, found, the, found themselves having to leave an abusive relationship uh, and needs friends to step in to assist. Uh, it uh, allows the person in need to post tasks that need to be done uh, and then to send that out to their friends who can put themselves down to uh, water the garden, pick, walk the dog, uh, pick up the kids from school, make a meal. Uh, Gather My Crew is, is the most fabulous online resource and certainly encourage you to use it and to tell friends of, of yours about using it. Uh, but it is also, uh, as, uh, as Nikki points out, a, a form of informal volunteering, which doesn't tend to be captured in surveys. Uh, we, uh, uh, we've, done, we've done this, I think, for a, a reasonable reason, which is that we want to draw some clear lines around what constitutes volunteering. Uh, but it does mean that this is a form of engagement that isn't as cleanly captured in surveys. Has it been going up while formal volunteering is going down? I don't know for sure, but my guess is probably not. Given what we know about what's happened to friendship networks, about a no number of people who know their neighbours, about formal volunteering, uh, I'm concerned that this kind of informal volunteering may also be on the way. Uh, and Nikki's right, we should do a better job of, of somehow capturing it in the ABS surveys. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, Paul Van Bruegel from the Y Whittlesey. Um, my interest is in working with young people who um, don't attend school or don't succeed at school, and we're in the process of trying to increase provision in the area for that. But listening to the answers, and I hear lots about policy, and I think my observation over many years working with that client group is you know, they, they absolutely fit the topic today. They have an absence of social connection and we, we see so much about the lack of resilience for young people. And we've seen the young people who need that type of service shift from you know, your, your classic kids on the street causing trouble to in the bedroom completely isolated from anyone, including their only fa own family members. But my observation has also been that while we have policies and solutions that have good intentions, the political dialogue that sits behind this issue and many other issues are about casting people as other and different and deficient. And I think that's, to me, a key thing that causes people to struggle to engage with the very policies and services that we're trying to put in place and design. So I'm really interested in your views on how we can have a different political dialogue, and I'll include that dialogue of political differences between you know, political philosophies, because everything I hear is about division. And the more we divide, the less we step away from that beautiful statement we had in the welcome to country, that we are all one. We are all commonly human. And I think that's where I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit. Yeah, thank you, Paul. And thanks for the work that you do. Uh, there is a style of politics which does try and divide people into uh, makers and takers, into leaners and lifters, into, in Britain they talk about strivers versus skivers. Uh, that idea that there's a group of people in the society who rely on welfare and then there's the people that produce the taxes to pay for the welfare. And the statistics just don't bear that out. Uh, so the Melbourne Institute's HILDA survey looks over the course of a decade uh, at income support use by Australian households and finds that two thirds of Australian households make some use of the income support system 
over the course of a decade. Uh, that might well be a child who's going off to uh, study. Uh, it might be a family who goes through a rough patch where someone loses a job. Uh, it could well be someone who, who uh, makes use of the pension. Uh, so the social safety net uh, is there much more as a, a resource that a majority of us tap into, uh, not simply for a marginalised group in society. I think that's important in the context of what you're talking about, because it really is a reminder that all of us are in it together and all of us have a shared commitment to a social safety net. All of us too have a shared, a shared commitment towards making sure that our young people are, are doing well. Um, I was uh, speaking to a, a colleague the other day who said that she will occasionally have um, some pretty feisty conversations on her street stalls with people who say, well, why on earth are we, uh, are we give, giving, uh, giving money to these kids? Why should, why should we be giving money to these kids? And she says she doesn't think she can win them over in, in a single uh, conversation, but she finds one thing that can set them back is uh, by saying, well, we give them a very small, very small amount of money, not very much, and when they get that, they don't try and break into your house at the end of the day. Uh, if you don't want to give them anything, then you'd better go down to Bunnings and get some bars for the, wall, for the, for the windows because that's going to look more like South Africa uh, because if we don't support the most, most vulnerable, then that's going to come back on you. Now, of course, that's a pretty narrow way of thinking about what the social safety net is, but it helps to break open the debate from somebody like that who is just intractably opposed uh, to, to assisting the most vulnerable. Ultimately, as you say, it's that holistic notion that uh, uh, each of us ought to be, uh, I want to say our brother's keeper, but our siblings, uh, uh, our siblings keeper, I guess, is the non-gendered way of putting it, uh, to be each of us have a responsibility uh, to, those, to those, around, those around us. Um, and practising that in politics has been what we've, we've aimed to do. Uh, we have aimed to, to, make, uh, to take some of the uh, unnecessary partisanship uh, out of the political process since we've come to office. Uh, Australians have conflict fatigue and simply want a government that's going to get on with the job. So to the greatest extent possible, uh, we've tried to have uh, to be a government which is focused on practical solutions, on getting things done, on measuring what works, uh, and on serving absolutely everybody in the society, uh, not just those who ticked a particular box in the, uh, on polling day.